Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for Kids and Others, where I will attempt to answer all kinds of questions about um, science and technology. So, let's see. Okay, here's a fairly straightforward one. What is the difference between bits and bytes? Bytes, B-Y-T-E-S. Uh, people often talk about computer kinds of things in terms of uh, bits and bytes. Okay, so what is a bit? A bit is just a single, uh, a single piece of information, a zero or a one. It's something, it, it's, uh, something is there or not there. It's, it's something that can be represented as zero, it's not there, one, it's there, just one thing. A byte is a collection of eight such things. So in a byte, there are eight bits and each bit can be either zero or one. So if you think about, let's, let's say there were two bits in a byte, then the number of different possible forms of the whole byte would be four because it's two times two, there are uh, two possibilities for the first bit, two possibilities for the second bit. So that's the, that will be either zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. Uh, the corresponding thing for eight bits is uh, two times two times two times two, eight times, otherwise known as two to the power eight, otherwise known as 256. Why? Um, talking bits and bytes. That's, um, the, uh, um, why do these things, what, what are these things for? Well, when one constructs memories for computers, in the end, one is dealing with individual bits. Either there is a piece of essentially electric charge somewhere or there isn't. That's if there is, it corresponds to one, actually it's sometimes reversed, but, but for in a first approximation, when, when it is there, it counts as a one, when it isn't there, it counts as a zero. And there are many different ways of representing a bit in uh, different sort of electronic systems. These days, most electronic systems are, well, essentially the, 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 the main memory of a computer is uh, RAM, random access memory. Random access memory means you can pull out, but well, actually, let me come to that later. Um, but in the end, the memory anything that is stored in computer memory as, is stored as a collection of bits. And those bits are represented by the presence of some, some electric charge in the, in the semiconductor chip or the absence of it. Um, when if, for example, you are sending data over, uh, over a network, um, a, a bit, a one might be, there is radio energy at that moment in a Wi-Fi signal, or there isn't, that will be a zero. Or there is, if it's a, um, uh, if it's on a, a wire, electrical wire, it would be like a, a network cable. It would be there is a voltage, a a pushing of electrons through the wire at that moment, and there isn't at the next moment. And the, when there is a voltage pushing, then that corresponds to a, a one bit, and when there isn't, it corresponds to a zero bit. Again. In, in actuality, these things are done in a little bit more complicated ways. Like, like for example, just to explain that one, uh, it turns out not to be a particularly good idea if you are just sending lots of zeros to say, okay, that's no voltage at all. It turns out to be a better idea to encode these things in such a way that you're kind of uh, feeding them through technically a linear feedback shift register sequences so that you effectively are, are making the thing that represents all zeros to be some, some whole pattern of ones and zeros and the thing that represents all ones to be some pattern of ones and zeros. So you don't have kind of the, the all ones being much more voltage and the all zeros being much less voltage. You're kind of splitting those two, uh, th those things into, you're, you're kind of uh, combining them with something which makes them be more evenly split between zeros and ones. So why does the concept of byte even exist? exist? Why does one deal with eight bits at a time? Uh, that's something that sort of emerged historically in the computer industry. Um, when I was a kid, for example, the computer that I used didn't have bytes. Um, it had bits. It had, um, uh, it had, um, uh, and it had 
so-called computer words. And the idea of a computer word is it's a collection of bits which will all be brought in together to the central processing unit of the computer to be processed. So for example, the bits in a word might represent a number, an integer. You'd write it out in binary and base two where instead of writing out digits zero through nine, you're just writing out the digits zero and one and you represent numbers that way. Um, and, uh, uh, but the idea is of a word is that's the unit of stuff from memory that you pull into the CPU all at a time. And um, in the early days of computers, uh, that's kind of what one talked about is the bits and words of computer memory. And it's not so useful to pull just individual bits from the computer memory into the CPU because to represent a number, you might use, I don't know, 32 bits, for example, or you might use some number of bits and that will be your way of representing a number. Or for example, you want to represent, I think I've talked about this before, you want to represent a character um, like a letter A or something. There is a, a um, for the 26 letters of the alphabet and the 26 uppercase letters and so on, you can represent all of those as patterns of bits that fit into, let's say an eight bit uh, block. There are 256 possibilities for that eight bit block which is enough to represent lowercase and uppercase letters and so on. And so the, 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 the original idea was words are the things that you typically operate on with the instructions of the computer. Bits are the underlying uh, sort of elements um, of memory in the computer. Okay, so that, was a, uh, that um, might have been a good idea, but then people would choose different word lengths. So for example, the first computer I used had an 18 bit word length. So whenever it was retrieving things from memory, it would come in an 18-bit blocks. And whenever it was representing numbers, it would represent numbers uh, using um, uh, the, the um, uh, using 18-bit sequences. So we can work out what that means. So for example, if you have an integer, a whole number, and you're trying to represent it with a sequence of zeros and ones. So the way that the the, the way that one uh, represents things in binary, you know, the number one is just a one, then a two is one zero, that's a, a, a one in the twos column and a zero in the, in the units column, and then three is one one, and then four is one zero zero, five is one zero one, uh, six is one one zero, seven is one one one, and so on. And, and you're, that's, that's how you count up in binary. So if you have a, a length two to the 18, uh, if you have an 18 bit well, the, the more common case, if you have a 16-bit word, there will be 665,536. You would be able to count up to 65,535. Um, 65, um, 65,335 um, 65, will be the maximum number you can represent because that's a sequence of uh, 16 ones, that's the number that they represent. Now there's some trickiness when you're dealing with, for example, if you want to encode both positive and negative numbers, um, you have to use essentially one of the bits to represent the presence of a minus sign. That's not actually how it's done. Usually what's done is what's called two's complement uh, numbers, um, where you're kind of flipping the role of zeros and ones for things which are uh, negative numbers. And then the top bit is a one if it's negative and a zero if it's if it's positive. So in any case, the the um, uh, for an eighteen bit word computer, that means you have sixty five thousand times four, um, so about two hundred fifty thousand possibilities for the integers that you can use. So you can store an integer up to about two hundred fifty um, uh, thousand um, with in in one word of that computer memory. Okay, so what happened is there were uh, people started uh, talking about computers in terms of their word length. There were kind of 8-bit computers, which had 8-bit words. There were 16-bit computers, 32-bit computers, and 64-bit computers. So roughly historically, what happened is the, the very earliest microprocessor chips were 8-bit kinds of things. Even today, there are 8-bit processors that are used for very low-level purposes. Um, but then by... Uh, when personal computers started to get used, 
there were, um, uh, those were mostly 16-bit, um, uh, they, they used um, uh, microprocessors that were basically 16-bit microprocessors. Then by the time uh, the bigger computers and the computers that started emerging in the 1980s as sort of personal-like computers uh, were 32-bit computers in the sense that their primary word length was 32 bits. And then in the 90s, in the 1990s, um, people started using 64-bit word length computers. But the problem is, the point is that depending on what you want to use the data in your computer for, you sometimes want to use, uh, for example, let's talk about integers. If you are storing something where the value of the thing is always between zero and 255, you might as well use a single byte, just eight bits. If you're storing something that is less than 65,000, use 16 bits. If you're using, if you need to store something that's less than uh, either 2 billion or 4 billion, use 32 bits. And if you want to store something even bigger, use 64 bits. And so what started happening is that computers, instead of just having a particular word length where they would always gulp in memory in that, that size words, there started to be instructions that were, do this for 16-bit integers, do this for 32-bit integers, do this for, for 64-bit integers and so on. And so that meant that it was no longer sensible to talk about bits and words. And so the idea of bytes came in as a representation of this clump of eight bits. And I think it was first driven by, uh, for sort of um, uh, English language type character sets, the fact that you can fit the representation of all the letters of the alphabet and so on into one byte, the 256 possibilities of one byte. Um, the, uh, so uh, this, uh, the thing that, so, so why have people even worried about 16 bit, 32 bit uh, kinds of computers? Well, one problem is when you have an integer and let's say you're counting up and counting up and counting up, let's say you're storing that integer in eight bits, single byte, and you count up, start from zero, one, one, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Keep counting up, keep counting up. What happens when you get to 255, which is a sequence of eight ones? What happens when you count up again? Well, you wrap around, you get back to zero again. You, you do a carry, it's like having in decimal, you'd have a bunch of nine, 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 nines. You add one to that, you get one, zero, zero, zero. But if you didn't have room for that extra one, if you didn't have enough places to put that extra one, if you didn't have enough bits, in the case of the binary number, to store that extra one, you wrap around to zero again. And there are many purposes for which that is a total disaster to have you think you're counting up, but actually, you get to the point where you wrapped around and got to zero again. Uh, famously, there was a missile system that had a counter that would count up over time. And um, it, uh, uh, this was in the 19, actually even the early 1990s. Um, it, would, it would count up, would count up. And unfortunately, it, when it got to, uh, it, it, it was a 16 bit counter and it was counting up every second or something. And after 65,000 seconds, um, if it was left switched on or whatever, it would wrap around and then it would get very confused. Um, and a typical thing you might do, let, let's say you store the, uh, the date when you created a file, uh, you store that as a number. Let's say you store it a very common way to, to represent um, uh, dates of files as the number of seconds since, 19, since January 1st, 1970, um, when this file was created. You've got all these numbers, but you don't have quite enough, um, you don't have enough digits, and you keep, you, 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 you think you're comparing to, the, 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 you've kind of run out of digits, and um, then uh, the comparison doesn't work. A very famous example of this was the Y2K problem uh, that happened in the year 2000, um, not, this doesn't specifically relate to bits and bytes, but it relates to the ways that people stored numbers in computers. Um, the, uh, what had been done from the earliest computers in the 1950s and so on, people had said, oh, the year for a date can just be specified by two digits because it might be 1955, 
It would just be 55. It might be 1963, 63. It's all good. Well, it's all good until you reach the year 2000. And in the year 2000, you will have, you know, you'll go from 99 back to 00. And so then if you're making a comparison, is this date after that date, it'll go wrong. And uh, uh, the, um, and for example, for people who were lucky enough to be 100 years old in the year 2000, all kinds of strange um, uh, kind of um, uh, medical record type things were happening of people um, uh, had the potential to happen of people being, you, you know, you must be a newborn now um, because the, uh, uh, the, the date when you were, your date of birth, we can calculate what is the difference between the date today and your date of birth. Oh, it's only two weeks. Well, actually, it should have been 100 years plus, plus two weeks. Well, in any case, the, there was a, a huge kind of uh, 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 concern that the world would end at, um, uh, at the moment of, uh, of midnight between um, uh, 1999 and the year 2000. Um, and uh, uh, there was an awful lot of, of push to upgrade computer systems to be able to deal with uh, four four number dates rather than two number dates. Um, in the end, it wasn't really a very big deal. Um, no, uh, no dramatic mistakes were made, no dramatic systems failed or anything like that. As a matter of fact, there's another one of these coming up in the year 2038. Um, the, uh, uh, the thing I mentioned of storing number of seconds since 1970, um, that, uh, uh, let's see, what will that be getting to? That will be getting to uh, the place where with 31 bits, I think, maybe 32 bits, um, you run out of uh, uh, you run out of numbers and that will wrap around again. So if people haven't fixed it by the year 2038 for most computers, that will be another instance of the Y2K type problem um, happening again. But uh, so what typically is done on computers these days is you will be dealing with uh, instead of dealing with words, nobody really defines the word length of a computer anymore. Well, sometimes they, sometimes you talk about uh, uh, for some very small computers, for some uh, microcontrollers and things like that, you will discuss that 16 bits uh, and so on. Um, but for, for sort of genuine computers, it's usually not talked about because what's, what's really happening is that the... Um, uh, uh, that, that the, it's, it's a question of which instructions you use in the operating system. Okay, there's another wrinkle on this whole thing, which has to do with the way that you address pieces of memory. So you're storing all this data in memory and you specify it by where in memory it is. And the where is specified by memory address and that address is again a number. And the question is how big can that number be? And if that number is going to fit in, let's say, 32 bits, the maximum size of that number is, well, basically 2 to the power 32, uh, roughly 4 billion. So that means that if you are going to specify addresses in the memory of a computer in, a 32, bit, in, in 32 bits, you end up uh, only being able to address uh, 4 billion different locations in the computer's memory. Um, and uh, typically you specify locations by their, you specify byte locations. You don't specify the bit locations, you specify the byte eight bit locations. And those are um, those addresses, if you are only having a 32 bit uh, um, specification of the addresses, you can only deal with 4 billion bytes. Um, I, I should say that, that in, uh, the sort of evolution of computers of, of how much memory can they address. Uh, the, the sort of the common thing up until a few years ago was the limit is 4 billion bytes, um, 4 gigabytes. Um, actually, the limit was often 2 gigabytes because the last bit got used for special, special purposes and you couldn't use it to specify an address in memory. Uh, well, then that really wasn't enough because there are plenty of things that are larger than two gigabytes, four gigabytes, whatever. Um, even, you know, uh, well, lo lots of kinds of data, whether they're movies or other kinds of things get to be longer than that. High resolution, you know, movie uh, 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 data, things, things of this kind. So there's a big push to move everything to 64-bit uh, 
to use 64-bit addresses. And that was not so much a problem for the hardware of computers because that had already been set up to be able to use 64 bits. It was a problem for software on computers and operating systems, for example, would be assuming 32 bits and then they would have to be revised to be 64-bit operating systems. And a lot of software had to be revised that way. And certainly for Wolfram Language, we had a, a big effort to revise things to work so that everything could be stored in a 64-bit way. So 64 bits, um, you get to have, uh, let's see, it must be a billion trillion uh, different possibilities, a billion trillion um, uh, bytes of memory, um, which is probably going to be enough for a while. Uh, and that's, um, and so 64 bits has sort of become the standard for, for typical computers of um, uh, the, the length of an address um, and uh, the, the way that you can specify positions in memory. Now, just to, uh, I'm not sure how much detail to get into here, but perhaps people might find interesting some of the actual issues with this. So when computers fetch data from memory, although you can in principle say, I want data starting at this particular byte, most modern computers do not do that very efficiently. Most modern computers actually gulp things from memory in larger chunks. Um, and uh, so one of the issues when you set up software is that you want to align various kinds of data structures so that they're aligned on at least 64-bit, maybe 128-bit, 256-bit boundaries. So you're not ending up requesting sort of a byte from this chunk and a byte from that chunk. It's almost as if the modern version of this idea of word length has become these big chunks that get pulled into memory, uh, pulled into the CPU together. And, and I mean, again, more technical detail, but the way computer memories are set up, there are usually different levels of hierarchy of the computer memory. There's a, a very big memory that's kind of slow to get things from. And then there are a sequence of levels of cache, um, which are where you kind of move things into that faster memory, um, but you can't move as much into the faster memory. And then it becomes a big issue for operating systems to figure out what is worth moving into the fast cache memory uh, uh, because it's likely to get used in a computation that you're doing. So they're typically level one, level two caches, things like this that are of different speeds and different sizes. And there are lots of algorithms that have to do with figuring out, okay, you are kind of iterating over some array of data. You're looking at this, then this, then this, then this. Okay, the computer can predict. You're probably gonna want to, want to look at something uh, further down the array soon. So prefetch that stuff into the cache memory um, uh, so that it is ready, so you don't have to go and fetch it from main memory. Um, and so that's, that's, uh, that's sort of part of that, that story. So in any case, there, there are this idea of, um, I mean, it, it gets in the actual sort of uh, computer engineering level of this gets fairly complicated. But the basic point is the unit of sort of uh, memory that you can reasonably separately get from the main memory of a computer is in these 8-bit clumps, which are bytes, even though the individual pieces of memory are just bits. Uh, by the way, people have tried back in the early days of computers, people tried all sorts of different configurations. Uh, famously, there was some actually Russian computers that used uh, ternary instead of using bytes that could have just values, uh, sorry, bit, in bits that were just zero and one, they could be, well, actually, they usually had zero, one, and minus one. Um, and there are some algorithms that are very, can be done in a very cool way on computers that have ternary, um, ternary ways to represent their data, but it's a bit hard to understand and it, it kind of didn't, didn't make it. Um, and uh, so, so that, that's, um, that's the story of that. Um, well, I think um, uh, maybe I can say, uh, yeah, I think this, this whole question of, um, I think somebody had asked um, uh, about a sufficiently smart compiler. Um, uh, okay, well, first of all, what does a compiler do? So if you have, so, Intrinsically, a, a microprocessor inside a computer knows how to do a certain set of instructions. 
Those instructions are things like, go to this address in memory and load the data that's from there into some register inside the CPU, inside the central processing unit. Another instruction might say, take the things in registers one and two and add them together and put the result in register three. Another thing might say, uh, go, to the next, uh, go to the next step in the program, which will be a uh, picking another instruction to do out of those machine code instructions that are part of the, the ones in the, the microprocessor. So a program ends up being a sequence in the end, a sequence of machine code instructions that say things like, take the content of register one, add it to the content of register six, put the result in register seven, store register seven back in the main memory of the computer. Or another thing they could say is, if the value of register two is less than zero, then skip the next machine code instruction and go on to the one after that or jump out of this whole list of machine code instructions that you're going to execute in sequence, jump to instruction number 137. Um, or another, so those are, that's the very lowest level, what the machine is doing at, so that's what's built into the hardware of the machine is those very low level instructions. Now, when you write a program uh, in any programming language, um, you will be writing it in something much higher level than that. You will be referring to the variable x, and you'll be saying, you know, if x is greater than zero, uh, you know, add two to x or something. Um, those are things you might might specify. That is in the language that you're specifying things in. That needs to be compiled into machine language ultimately for it to be executable on the machine. There are there are in broad categories. There are two basic ways that typical languages work to be compiled so that you give the specification of what you want to do in that language. And then there is a moment where the effort has gone to to convert that to machine code. And then what you're doing is just executing that machine code. That's kind of strategy number one. Strategy number two is an interpreter where at the moment where that those uh, instructions are going to be executed, then they, what, 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 what's happened is you, the language is um, like, like an instruction like um, uh, is x greater than zero. Um, instead of having turned that once and for all into machine code, the, the thing like if is implemented as a bunch of machine code, the x greater than zero is implemented as a bunch of machine code, and that machine code is executed at the time when when you're actually running that program. So in compilation, you convert everything to machine code once and for all. In interpreted, when things are interpreted, you have the interpreter that is written in machine code and that is doing the things that the language specifies to do. And it's just doing it um, as, as, the, um, as, as one comes to that place in the program in, in the higher level language. So, in fact, in like Wolfram language, there's a complicated combination of interpreted and compiled kinds of things that happen. It's quite often that one does, uh, well, one can do just-in-time compilation, where let's say one has something which is gonna be executed many times. Okay, I should explain. When you do compilation, when you convert the program to machine code, that takes some effort to do that. We'll talk about what's actually involved in doing it, but it takes some effort to do that. Um, if you're going to, but once you've done it, you have this very efficient thing in machine code. Um, and so if you're gonna execute something 10,000 times, it might make sense to convert it to machine code once and for all, then just run the machine code 10,000 times. If you're only gonna execute the thing once, well, you probably don't want to pay the cost of converting it to machine code. You just want to run the interpreted code, just run it once and you're done. So there are strategies it's like just-in-time compilation, we do a bunch of that, that um, uh, says, if it looks like you're gonna do this a bunch of times, like for example, in, in Wolfram language, if you're gonna make a plot of a function, it's gonna evaluate that function many, many times. So it knows it's gonna do that. So it compiles that function essentially into machine code before it starts having to evaluate it all those times. Okay, so the... Um, uh, uh, what's involved in, in making a compiler? 
um, what's involved in converting from the sort of high level description of things down to machine code. First, I should explain uh, the notion of an assembler. When, okay, back, okay, when people started writing programs for computers in the 1950s, they always wrote in machine code. They just specified in precise detail, these are the things that the hardware of the computer can do. I want the computer to do this, then this, then this. It's all written in machine code. Um, and so that meant, for example, that if they said, I want to store the value of this thing, I want to store it in this location in memory, location 1726 in memory. They would put that number 1726 right there. And that would be that their program would have those literal numbers in it. Okay, so then the next level up is to make an assembler where instead of having to have 1726 as a raw number, you could, for example, uh, well, actually, actually, I'm I'm um, I'm getting ahead of myself here. The, the first level is just to um, uh, to not specify the in, in pure machine code. You're specifying the different instructions that you do just as numbers themselves. Like the instruction that says, "Is this greater than zero or not?" That might be instruction 37, and you would just represent that instruction as instruction 37 operating on memory location 1726. And your program would just be a series of numbers, actually a series of, of uh, uh, data in, in binary. And that, that's what the earliest programs were like. Um, in assemblers, you end up with uh, uh, not specifying the instructions um, as raw numbers. Um, you can specify them as some, um, as uh, uh, you know, by, by, by giving them a, a name, um, you know, they'll have some standard name. Now, you know, boy, it's a long time since I wrote assembly code. Um, and I'm trying to remember how far this goes. I think um, there are many other kinds of sort of simplifications that allow you, that give you more structure than just seeing the raw sequence of numbers. But back when uh, in the 1970s, uh, most serious programs were written in assembly language. And most programs that exist today that started in the 1970s are written in assembly language. Um, by, there were other languages like Fortran, um, uh, COBOL, uh, later by the late 1970s, C language, and so on, that existed. So those languages, one of the big things those did, those do, is to let you give names to things. So instead of saying, uh, you could say X, and X, is a variable that is going to be stored in memory location 1726, but you're not responsible for deciding where it's going to be stored. The computer is going to do that automatically. And, and also you're able to, uh, uh, originally Fortran, which was invented in the late 1950s, the name Fortran stood for formula translation. And so the idea was you could write things like X plus Y times Z, and that would be a formula that would then be translated into machine code where that would, the X would be at location such and such, the plus was this machine instruction 72 or something, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that was kind of the, um, uh, but, but at the time, so in, in something like the C language, um, you get to specify, I want a variable X. Now, a very important point about when you specify that variable X is you have to say, what type of variable is that? You know, for example, how many bits are you going to use to store the value of X? For example, X could be a 16-bit integer. Then the uh, then it, it it's going to be set up so that it that X is going to be allocated some place in memory that will fit a 16-bit integer. Um, and so, typically, what happens is you're specifying these different types that are going to be used for different variables. So a, a variable might be an int, an integer. Um, it might be a, uh, a float, a floating point number. It might be a double, a double precision floating point number. Um, unfortunately, in the because of the evolution of computers, there was a lot of confusion about how long is an int representing integer? Is it 16 bits? Is it is it 32 bits? Is it 64 bits? Then there was the idea of a long, a short, this is in the C language at least. Um, and these things sort of gradually migrated and got rather confused. But 
in, in basic terms, when you specify a variable in a low level language, you are specifying, you have to specify the type so that the language knows how that variable will be, will be laid out in memory. So then there are slightly more complicated things. Like in C, there are things called structs where you can say, uh, instead of just saying, I've got, let's say you're trying to represent uh, lat latitude, longitude on the earth. You might make a struct which says, I'm always gonna have two floating point numbers in there, but I'm going to refer to them by a single named variable. I could call it X and the X has uh, uh, this specification that has both a latitude and a longitude. So that's a, another sort of level of abstraction in specifying things. Another critical idea is the idea of an address. So for example, uh, you've got this, this uh, variable or, or for example, a struct and you've got the struct and you want to uh, specify that struct for another part of your program. How do you refer to that struct? Well, the typical way you would refer to it is by the address of that struct, by saying, where was that struct stored in memory? And that's another kind of type of thing is a pointer, so-called pointer to memory, that's another type like integers and floats as pointers. And um, uh, there's also, an, and that's often used to, when you have an array of data, you're going from, from uh, you specify the, the, uh, the zeroth element, the first element, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're, you're kind of, those are successive positions in memory. And so you're specifying those by giving a pointer, you, you add something to the pointer. It's tricky because you have to know what kind of data is being stored in that array. If it's 32-bit integers, you know you have to, the, the successive pointers have to be four bytes larger to go to the next integer in the sequence. If they were storing 64-bit integers, they'd have to be eight bytes larger to get to the next integer. So you have to know that when you're doing all these kinds of things. So what does the compiler do? The compiler basically is trying to convert the code that you write in some low level language, let's say, into uh, uh, it's trying to resolve all of the things that you wrote down in your program and resolve them ultimately into machine code. I should say there's another big thing that you do in programs, which is to define functions. You say, I'm gonna have some function f of x and it's going to uh, do this, it's gonna add one to x, it's gonna return the result. How does that work? Well, when you call a function, um, one of the things that has to happen is you're running code and inside that code, there's a function that you call. And the, uh, then what the CPU has to start doing is paying attention to what was the inside of that function. You've been running a bunch of existing code, then you call a function, the CPU has to kind of say, okay, now I've got to pay attention to what's inside that function. But there's all the rest, and then after that function finishes, it's got to return and go on with the rest of the code you'd specified. Okay, so one of the things that's tricky about that is when you're running a piece of code, maybe it has all these variables, X and Y and Z and so on, and you're storing those somewhere in, in memory. And then you're, or, or you've, you've got those actually in, in registers in the CPU because they're being actively worked with. And then you call a function F and it wants to use those registers itself. It wants to, it wants to use them for its own purposes, but you've still got that outer program that is making use of those registers. And when the function returns, you have to restore the states of those registers again. So how does that work? So the big idea there is this thing called the stack. Um, and the notion is, it's like a stack, like a stack of plates. And the notion is when you uh, are going to call that inner function, all the things that were part of that outer function get, they are, they are uh, well, actually this is some, um, I'm saying it slightly the wrong way around. Those things are stored on the stack. And when you, um, uh, when, you, um, uh, when you call this function, you are, you are putting more variables. You're, you're allocating this, the new variables that you're going to use in that function on the stack. When that function returns, that, it's like you're taking that plate back off the stack and the plates that were underneath it kind of come up to the top again. And so that mechanism of, of the stack is, is the way that you call, you, you call uh, functions within functions within functions, you're pushing, you're, you're going further down on the stack. A typical way that a computer's memory is laid out is it has a memory that is allocated on the stack for use temporarily within functions. And then it has another kind of memory 
called heap memory, which is memory that is sort of more permanently used in your program and isn't doesn't just sort of go away when the function that makes use of, of that memory exits. So to explain this a little bit more clearly, a uh, typical thing is that in a function, you will say there are some local variables within this function that are things that the function is operating on. Those are allocated memory on the stack. When that function exits, that memory is automatically given back to the operating system. In a typical setup, you've got this memory address space where every piece of memory is specified by a particular numerical address. And the typical model is that the heap is memory addresses coming up from zero and the stack is memory addresses coming up from coming down from the maximum value. Um, often many operating systems will allocate a fixed amount of stack to a particular program. So if you have too deeply nested a sequence of functions, it will just it will blow up its memory, not because it really ran out of memory, but because the memory that was allocated for this kind of um, uh, you know, stalactite that was coming down from the, the top of memory space um, was was not enough. Not enough was allocated to it. Okay, so that, that's a little bit of sort of the low levels of what's happening when you are taking something like a program written in a low level language like C and turning it into machine code. But uh, all of that stuff happens automatically in a compiler. You just write your C program and it is converted to specify how things should work in machine code. And so how does that work? Now, I should say, just to sort of zoom ahead, when we get to something like Wolfram Language, all of this detail about type types and memory allocation, all these kinds of things, you never have to do that. This has all been automated away. This is, the, this is you know, something like, like Wolfram Language is just a much higher level uh, way of interacting with a computer. And all of those low level details are things you don't have to worry about. But let me explain how a compiler for a low-level language works. What you're going to try to do is to take, um, uh, well, let's see. The, the, in the lowest-level languages, you specify the type of everything. So you, what the language really has to do, what the compiler has to do is to say, OK, this function is allocating two integers and one real number on, on the stack. Okay, what does that actually mean in machine code? It means I have to allocate this number of bytes of memory, do that. It says um, in, the in the language, it says, you know, if X is greater than seven, go to this place in the code or switch on these values to decide which piece of code to run. All of that has to get converted into raw machine code in the end. And that's and what the compiler typically does is it, uh, well, the first thing it does is it, there's the raw code that you've written, a bunch of characters you typed in. It makes a thing called an abstract syntax tree, which is kind of an internal data representation of the, the thing that you typed. It turns, if, if you say X plus Y times Z, it turns that into kind of a tree structure that says there's a plus at the top and it's got an X on one side and it's then on the other side, it's got something which is a sub piece of the tree of times of Y and Z. That's what, uh, for example, if you look at full form in Wolfram language, you see the actual tree structure, which Wolfram language directly uses as a way of representing symbolic expressions. But in, in, a, in a typical kind of uh, uh, compiler, what the first stage is to take the raw text that you've written and turn it into this kind of tree structured uh, thing that represents kind of where, where all these different operations, all these different pieces of the program are represented in a sort of hierarchical way. Okay, so then there's all sorts of analysis that has to be done to figure out, you know, how much memory do you allocate for this? How do you, how do you arrange that to that? Eventually you're going to generate code you are going to actually produce the machine code from these different uh, pieces of the different specifications of operations. There's often an intermediate language that you convert into before you convert to the raw machine code. So for example, these days there's a thing called LLVM, low level virtual machine, uh, which is a, a kind of a somewhat standardized intermediate language that is sort of the next level up before you're converting directly into the machine code. And by the way, machine code will be different for each particular kind of machine. And um, uh, the, the, so that's, you can have this intermediate language, which is the same for different machines, or at least somewhat the same, not quite the same, even at that level. Um, 
that then gets converted into pure machine code. Okay, the tricky part of compilation is optimization. And uh, what optimization is about is, uh, okay, there are many different machine code sequences and machine code instructions, which could all achieve the same result. Which one should you use? And so I'll give you an example of one tricky thing, uh, so-called register allocation. So let's say that your CPU has, well, the real number will be much larger than this, but let's say your CPU has four really fast pieces of memory, really fast registers. And you've got a program that has 20 variables in it, 20 things that are going to be stored, that could be stored in registers. Okay, as you go through actually executing the program, of those 20 things that could be stored in registers, at any given moment, uh, you can only have four of those stored in, actual, in these actual fast registers. Which ones should you store? So that's an example of a, a kind of operation that is done by compilers is to figure out based on the structure of your code, it may know, oh, these are the four that's, that are being used in this section of the code. We don't have to worry about these other ones. We can bring those in later. Actually, the way that register allocation is usually done is a clever algorithm invented actually by a friend of mine long ago, um, which is that if you imagine a graph that sort of is a connections between this piece of code depends on this other piece of code. You're, you're saying how the sort of flow of data goes from one piece of code to another. And you imagine coloring the nodes on the graph and, or, or numbering the nodes on the graph, but let's say coloring, and you have red, green, blue, purple or something. And then the, it will, the question of whether you can allocate uh, two things to the same register ends up boiling down to the question of whether you can, how you color the graph so that you never have two red nodes next to each other. Um, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's, that's sort of the idea. So you're, you're figuring out how to arrange where you put the register, where you put the specification of the registers on this graph so that you will never have this collision and that's how you allocate registers. So that would be an example of a, of a compiler operation, but there are many others. In fact, it's not uncommon to do, I guess it's called peephole compilation, where you'll actually just take uh, pieces of the machine code and essentially randomly rearrange them and uh, to try and find the one that works fastest. And if it's a small enough number of instructions, there's a decent chance that you, know, you try a thousand possibilities, one of them will be right. No human may necessarily have ever figured out that that was a better way to write that piece of code, um, but the computer could figure it out just by uh, sort of proving a theorem that that piece of code is equivalent to the thing that you originally had. So over the years, optimization in compilers, for a while it was a very slow process. When you would compile something, you'd say, I want a low optimization level. I, I don't need this code to be super fast. I just don't want the compilation to take 15 minutes. And then gradually over time, compilation uh, optimization has gotten faster and um, uh, at this point, even up to the highest levels of optimization, you can typically do it very fast. Um, but that's kind of the, the, the sort of the main kind of neat thing in compilers is that you can do this optimization. What does that mean? That means that there was long ago in the 1970s, early 1980s, um, if a human were to write assembly code, they could do much better job than any compiler could do. But by now, most of the time, an optimizing compiler will vastly outperform a human in terms of making a good assembly code, good machine code uh, for something. So, I mean, just to give a sense of, of how it gets a little bit more complicated than this, if this wasn't complicated enough, uh, for example, in Wolfram language, where we have a much higher level representation of what's going on, we also have compilation. And actually, for example, right now, we, we're building a, a much more sophisticated compiler for Wolfram language one of the things that's tricky there is type inference. So you have, I said, well, X is an integer. It fits, it, like X is a 32-bit integer. It fits in, you can allocate just 32 bits of memory to store this integer. Okay, well, in Wolfram language, there are no types. Just X is whatever X could be. X could be an integer. It could be an integer with 100 digits. It could be a, um, uh, it could be a, just a string. It could be, uh, it could be some whole structure, it could be anything. And what we have to do in order to make efficient, to do efficient compilation is we have to take a program and we have to analyze that program and say, okay, in this program or in this section of this program, X will always be an integer less than uh, 
which will fit in 32 bits. Or it will be either an integer that fits in 32 bits, or it will be a real number of this characteristic or whatever else. And so what ends up happening is you're building up this kind of type calculus of given this piece of code, let me give an example. Let's say that you have X is a list of, of integers. Okay, now the piece of code says, select the first element of X. Well, if X was a list of integers, the first element of X is necessarily going to be just a single integer. So you can deduce the type of that part, first part of X from the type of X. Now it gets more complicated. Let's say you have something where you have a, a function um, that uh, 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 takes in a, um, uh, some symbolic structure that looks like this, gives one that looks like this. Um, that, that becomes a much more complicated piece of kind of uh, mathematical type analysis, sort of proof. You're, you're making these proofs of how types should be inferred and so on. So I think what was asked here was, um, uh, somebody asked what I meant by a sufficiently smart compiler. Um, I'm not sure exactly in what context that was, but, but um, this whole question about sort of how memory is, how things are laid out in memory, how, um, oh yeah, I was, I was talking about um, uh, things like, um, you know, in Wolfram language, for example, when we have to, in the compiler, when we have to actually specify how things are laid out in memory, the, the compiler has to figure out things about how to clump things together so that the memory will be pulled in in the right kind of gulps and so on. Um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly complicated and deep piece of essentially computer science to figure out how all this stuff should work. I mean, it used to be the case back in the day that the field of computer science, one of the, the definite things that was always taught back in the 1970s when computer science was a much more embryonic field was compiler design. Um, there was a sad moment, I think, when the total number of people in the world who were writing compilers was like in the tens of people, yet it was a thing that was taught in 100% of computer science courses. Um, and so it was kind of a bit of an imbalance. And that's still true. Very few people write compilers. Um, it's an interesting type of large-ish program to talk about. Um, and uh, so it's sort of of educational value for that reason, but it's definitely not in terms of practitioners uh, you know, writing compilers is a specialized task. Uh, okay. Let's see. Um, I think I'm almost running out of time, but, but um, uh, oh, boy. Um, oh, I was going to say one more thing about compilation. Um, the one of the issues is what's the target for the compiler? So CPUs are the usual target for compilers. GPUs, graphics processing units, which have their data organized differently and have different kinds of instructions, they are a whole new challenge for compilers, um, which has not yet been, been really completely met. That is, how do you take a program that was written in some language we already have and how do you convert it to something that can run efficiently on a GPU? That's, that's an example of sort of a frontier of that kind of thing. Um, let's see, Richard is commenting about lifting of programs to other forms of representation in which one could make, do more efficient optimization. Yeah, I mean, this whole question about what the right representation of a program is to best be able to manipulate the program. I mean, for example, let me give you an example. Again, it's a, a concept called tail recursion. So let's say you have a function. Uh, you have a function f, and let's say it even calls itself. The function f says, I want to take, um, well, I, this is kind of coding in the air, so to speak. Let me, basically the function f, let's say, takes as an argument some number, it, does something to that number and then it calls itself with that number minus one. And it keeps doing that until the number reaches zero, let's say. So then you have a big nested collection of F, 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 calling F, calling F, calling F, calling F. Um, that makes a deep recursion. And F calling F is typically something that takes, it takes a computer a certain amount of time to prepare the stack, to do the function call, et cetera, et cetera. 
But if what's happening inside that F is just the F is sort of calling itself again on its way out, you don't really need to do that recursive call. You can turn that whole thing into a pure iteration where the thing just loops over, do this, then this, then this, then this, without it having to go sort of inside recursively call functions. And so that's the type of transformation of tail recursion, uh, tail call optimization, I think it's called more commonly these days, um, where you kind of unroll that recursion into something, into something flatter. But so one of the things that is rather interesting to look at is if you kind of try and make this graph representing sort of the flow of, of control in a program and the flow of data in a program, uh, you look, make this graph, it's a big tangled mess for some particular complicated program you've written. Is there a way of sort of refactoring that graph so that it is more efficiently run on a computer? And actually some of the things we've been doing recently with kind of um, uh, representing uh, evaluation graphs in Wolfram language may give us a way to, to understand that. One of the issues, okay, another issue here. If you've got a computer that has not just one CPU, but it has multiple CPUs, or it has multiple cores on that CPU, multiple, a, a core is a part of the CPU which can independently execute instructions. So a modern, uh, a modern CPU chip might have eight cores, 16 cores, I don't know, more cores on it. And each one of those cores can be running different instructions. And so you can, in, in terms of operating systems particularly, you can talk about different threads where and sometimes within a single program, you can talk about different threads where each core on your, on your microprocessor chip is running a different thread. It's running a different piece of the program. Okay, so you've, if you've got a program, most programs are executed. You do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this. But the question is, can you in fact execute many things in parallel? So for example, let's say you have a big list of numbers and you're gonna add one to every number in that list. Well, you could do that by adding one to the first number of the list, then adding one to the second number in the list, then adding one to the third number in the list and so on. Or if you happen to have multiple cores or multiple CPUs, you could just say, okay, we've got eight CPUs, let's distribute those numbers in that, that, that list of numbers across those different CPUs Let's have one CPU add one to the first number, another CPU add one to the second number, and so on, and then collect the data back together again. So that kind of parallelism in, in Wolfram language, for example, we have functions that basically will try and execute things in parallel like that across multiple CPUs. But one of the questions for, for a sophisticated compiler is to see whether you can do that automatically, whether you can figure out, yes, you can actually use multiple threads. Now, it's a tricky thing for the compiler because the process of starting a new thread and getting that all set up, that can be a fairly expensive process. So if it doesn't, if there's not a bunch to do within those threads separately, there's no point in doing that. So it has to kind of optimize, is it worth just barreling through and doing this, doing this sort of sequential execution or is it worth having the extra sort of startup cost of setting up multiple threads and so on? Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's another kind of frontier of compilation, but it's something where these evaluation graphs that we're looking at, um, I think we may have a framework for understanding kind of when you can do things in parallel and when you have to do them sequentially. Um, it's almost, you can imagine a graph where you, you're saying these are, these are sort of threads of execution and you can just look at the picture and see these ones can be done in parallel. Oh, these ones, one depends on another, they have to be done in sequence. And that's, that's kind of the, the, the challenge of doing those kinds of things. And it's a, it's a tricky business because the, in, in, in Wolfram language, for example, uh, it's a rather clean, you can use it as a rather clean functional programming language, which means that everything you're operating on is just a function being applied to the results of another function and so on. With that setup, you can much more untangle this whole question about what depends on what than if you have something in typical and lower level languages, you will have something where you are sort of storing things in named variables. And then you're kind of the, the interdependence of things is, oh, this variable that got set over here is used in this other part of the code here. And there's kind of a much more action at a distance kind of mechanism that's going on about how data is flowing through the, through the, through the code. Well, okay, I think, um, we spent our whole time here talking about some um, uh, details of, of computers. Hopefully that was of interest to, to people here. Um, 
these these sort of engineering rabbit holes, um, uh, there is there is considerably more in this rabbit hole. But I think I touched on, if I didn't forget something, I think I touched on the main kind of uh, first level chamber of the rabbit hole, so to speak. Um, uh, most of the pieces of that, um, and uh, that was kind of a a, um, a, a rough summary of of, um, of some aspects of how how computers work. I didn't talk about. I just talked about individual programs. I didn't talk about things like operating systems and so on. Uh, people are interested. I'd be happy to talk about that some other time. Um, but uh, that's some um, that's that story. All right. I am supposed to go back to my day job, which um, involves. Uh, uh, See, I've I've built this kind of tower of tools that you know back in the 1970s I programmed in assembly language, but ever since the beginning of the 80s I've kind of built my own tools that are uh, very high above that level of programming and allow one to kind of uh, the sort of goal of our kind of Wolfram awesome language computational language is to uh, have a language where one can uh, where can the, the language represents the way one thinks about things computationally, rather than kind of representing the sort of low level, what are the operations that a computer can intrinsically do? And so for me, sort of operating at that level of how do I think about things is vastly more efficient than having to operate at the level of, well, let me worry about how this particular piece of memory in the computer should get used and oh, I didn't even talk about memory allocation. And, you know, I'm going to store this now in the memory of the computer. Oh, I'm not using that anymore. I've got to free that piece of memory. Oh, I forgot to free that piece of memory. All sorts of things went wrong. Or I freed that piece of memory while I was still using it. Oops, all those kinds of things. That is many, many, many layers down from the way that I, for example, uh, you know, use computational language or the way that both language is set up. Um, it's the whole point is to kind of automate all of that stuff away so us humans don't have to think about those kinds of things. But it's the job of, of those of us who build the language to make it not just as efficient to do it with those things abstracted away, but even more efficient than it would be if you were to go down in the trenches um, and start writing those things by hand. See, the reason it can be more efficient is that the computer is smarter at doing optimization than any human is going to be. And the real issue is, can the computer know enough about what you really want to do, it have the whole structure in, in its mind, so to speak, so that it knows what, how to do that optimization? That's a much better setup than you going in the trenches and trying to do the optimization yourself. But it's then the, the, the burden is put on the folks who are writing the system that is sort of automatically doing that optimization. And that's kind of us in the case of Wolfram language. And, that's the kind of thing we've been doing for the last 35 years is building that kind of tower of capabilities sort of that take you far above the level of sort of the intrinsic features of a computer. Most programming languages, traditional programming languages really do not take you far above the intrinsic operations of a computer. They deal with things like uh, allocation of memory. They deal with naming pieces of memory and things like that, but they don't deal with um, all of the other kinds of things of representing things in the world, uh, you know, they, they don't have an intrinsic way of representing, I don't know, an image or a, a graph or something like that. Um, so uh, anyway, um, all right, I should stop here, but thank you all for, for, for joining me. And um, I see questions about completely different kinds of things about ocean tides and stem cells and so on, and I look forward to talking about those next time. So thanks very much, and 